اعوذبلشیطانجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد اللہ اللہ کا نہ موجود ان قبل حدوث الاشیاء ویب کا بعد فنا الاشیاء تفرد بلاولیت والقدم وسما کل شعین ما ادا بالفنا والعدم کما قال الزشان ہوں کلو شعین حالکن اللہ وجہ و کلو نفس ذائقت الموت وقال کل من علیہ فان و اب کا وجہ رب قد الجلال و الکرام سبحان من لا یقف علیہ اختلاف النیات ولا یعزب عنہ معاس لباد فی الخلوات سبحان اللہ الذی منہ خلقہ العباد و علیہ المعاد فمن یعمل مثقال ذرت خیر یرا ومن یعمل مثقال ذرت شر یرا نشہد ان لا الہ الا ہوا الملک اللذی لا ینازع فی ملک ولا یضاد فی حکمہ یعذب من یشاء بما یشاء کیف یشاء ویرحم من یشاء بما یشاء کیف یشاء تعذیبه المسین عدل وافو تفضل ونشہد ان محمدا سید المرسلین مسئلہ علیہ وخیر المبشرین والمنذرین صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ الہدات المہدیین من رکب سفینتہم نجا واحتدا ومن تخلف عنہ اذل فغرق وحوا اوسیکم عباد اللہ بالعتسام بالتقوی فینہو حبل امتین وعروت الوثقا قال اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی فی کتابه المجید وفرکان الحمید بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا عطیو اللہ و عطیو الرسول و اولی الامر منکم آمنا باللہ و صدق اللہ العلی العظیم اللہم صلی اللہ السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی ان سوری النساء سیز او یو بلیو اوبی اللہ ان اوبی دا میسنجر and those vested in authority from among you. We have been discussing the itaat of Allah, the obedience of Allah, and we have discussed that obeying those whom He has commanded to be obeyed is in itself the tawheed and obedience to Allah. At the same time, He has also commanded us not to obey any sinners. We have been discussing the third category of those who have to be obeyed after Allah, the second category after Rasulullah, that is the Ulil Amr. And last time, we discussed that the first and the second Khalifa of the Muslims could not be Ulil Amr since they both neither had enough knowledge of the revelation nor the wisdom that is a prerequisite of this particular label that is there. Both these khulafa were challenged and proved that they were not the ulil amr of their time. We also briefly mentioned last time the incapacity of especially the second khalifa to serve justice in accordance to the Quran and sunnah which is a direct prerequisite of being the ulil amr. To identify the ulil amr we have to first look at who do not qualify and thereafter we will come to that stage when we will actually look at who the ulil amr are inshallah so we look into the third khalifa but before we go there there is an important aspect that we must understand that has been in the history of the muslims not it is not history of islam it is history of muslims the goalpost shifted when Rasulullah left this mortal world, the elite of the Muslims, and the maximum reported is about 13 people. 13 people in Medina gathered at the Saqifah of Banu Saada and selected the first Khalif. We don't want to go into the details of what happened there. The two main reasons that were given, besides many more, was that firstly Rasulullah did not appoint a successor after him. And therefore, it was the people to choose their own leader that would serve the cause of Rasulullah and the Quran. 
Nonetheless, within two years, the first Khalifa passed away. He died. And when he died, he appointed. The first one was selected. Now he appointed the second Khalifa because Islam could not survive without a leader. That was his statement. Such was the concern of the one who accepted Islam after Rasulullah, long after Rasulullah had made an open invitation to the people of Makkah. And we ask, Rasulullah who came with Islam, who sacrificed everything for Islam, did not have such concerns that there should be a leader after him to continue with the work of the Quran and his Sunnah. However, the shift of goalposts. When he was on his deathbed, after he was assassinated and he was about to die, he appointed a shura council of six people to select a khalifa for, from the ummah. So the, we can see that there was a shift of goalposts of leadership and how to get a leader amongst the Muslims in a span of 20 years. When we see the proceedings of the Shura Council, in which Amir al-Mu'minin has very clearly said, what do I, did I have to do with them, though he was part of the six? We see Abdurrahman ibn Auf, a very prominent elite of that time amongst the Quraysh, not amongst the Muslims, and who was a brother-in-law to Uthman ibn Af'an, was offered, uh, he offered, uh, Abdurrahman offered Khalafat to Imam Ali alayhi salam on three conditions. He said that you become the Khalifa only if you accept to rule with the Quran, Sunnah of Rasulullah, and the Seerah of Shaykhain, that is Abu Bakr and Umar. Imam immediately said that he will only rule and can only rule by the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah. The Shaykhain condition is not acceptable. This statement in itself proves that the seerah of the Shaykhain had certain issues that Amir al-Mu'minin did not approve of. Thus, Uthman was made the Khalifa. This was a pre-planned program. But he was given one condition additional to those three that were given, and that is that he will not appoint Banu Umayyah, anybody from Banu Umayyah, or give them any position in his Khilafat. However, when we see the Khilafat of Uthman, everything was overturned. Justice was absent, nepotism was the order of the day. Even the earlier ulama of the Ahl Sunnah have written about Uthman not being adherent to the qualities of Khilafa. Baitul Mal was considered as his personal property, and he spent it in ways that were considered not Islamic also. He gathered so much wealth for himself at the expense of the poor and the poverty of the people. When he was killed in 26 Hijra or uh, 30, 35 Hijra actually, it is said that he had gathered at that time 150,000 dinars, 20 million dirhams, besides herds of cattle, sheep, and camels. So what does these figures mean? Today, in today's terms, we are not talking in millions anymore. We now talk of billions and trillions. So what does this mean? Let us compare what Umar ibn Khattab, who was there just a few years before that, said. He and his son Abdullah had gone for Hajj, and they had spent a total of 16 dinars for the entire trip for both of them. 16, one six. And when they came back and when he asked his son what was the total amount that was spent, his son told him 16 dinars and he scolded him saying, "You, we were extremely extravagant and this was not the sunnah of Rasulullah to be so extravagant. 16 dinars, compare it to what Uthman had done. There were many other violations. For example, he brought back Hakam ibn As and Marwan, who were both banished by Rasulullah. His Khilafat 
immediately after he took khilafat there was a fight between him and abdurrahman his brother in law and they never spoke again until abdurrahman died despite having agreed to the terms of khilafat he did not adhere to any one of them he brought in banu umayya at every position and gave them all the high positions in the entire islamic world Wais ibn Umayya were the cursed ones in the Quran as well as well as by Rasulullah himself he paid no heed the situation was such that Aisha the wife of Rasulullah used to call him Nathal history is recorded and this is not Shia history Ahle Sunnah have recorded that Aisha used to call Uthman Nathal The term Nathal was used in that time as a derogatory term for the Jews who were cursed by Nabi Dawood and Nabi Salim Salam. So that is the term that was given by Aisha for Uthman, and such was her uh, hatred towards Uthman that she had not accepted that he even be buried after his death in Jannatul Baqi, the Muslim cemetery. and therefore we see he was buried right at the end of jannatul baqi which is an extension at that time it was the jewish cemetery so we ask was banu umayya really cursed in the quran yes in surah banu israil ayah number 60 allah says wama ja'alna ar-ru'ya allati arainaka illa fitnatan lin-nas wa ash-shajarati mal'unata fil quran and we did not make the vision that we gave you which we showed you but a trial for men and cur- and the curse tree in the quran as well the shajaratil mal'una that is there all the mufassirin ahle sunnah as well as shia say refers to the banu umayya in fact rasulullah had called marwan bin hakam the lizard son of the lizard the cursed one son of the cursed one and he had also condemned abu sufyan muawiya as well as yazid a very prominent feature of uthman's khilafat was the punishment of the righteous he punished those who were righteous and who spoke the truth sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad may i request we please put our telephones on silent mode please he refused why the first two khalifas obtained counsel from amir al mu'minin he refused to take counsel from imam ali alayhi salam and these righteous people were persecuted beaten up and their property confiscated they were given extreme punishment amongst those righteous ones the sahaba of rasulullah that were punished severely was abdullah ibn mas'ud who was a scribe of rasulullah in writing the quran during revelation ammar ibn yasir and abu dhar ghafari in fact uthman when compiling the quran we are told the quran that we have is compiled during the time of uthman yes however the original scripts that he collected by force from the scribes he burnt them down himself amongst his appointments were two major ones muawiya in the province of sham and walid ibn aqaba as the governor of kufa who is walid walid is the one who led fajr salat in the masjid of kufa and recited four rakats instead of two for fajr and said today i am in a mood would you like some more and he was totally intoxicated at that time such that the people at that time say that he was he even vomited in the mihrab of masjid kufa how could such blatant violations of the quran the sunnah of rasulullah be considered as ulil amr his deen allah did not send his deen and his books and his prophets and especially his most beloved habib muhammad mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam to the earth to establish any form of corruption he sent it to establish justice and righteousness 
how can we accept those who have violated all terms of the Quran, all norms of the Quran and Allah's guidance and accept them as ulil amr? So we see that again when we bring about the ayah of Quran, when we say in Surah Dahar, Allah says, وَلَا تُتِعْ مِنْهُمْ آثِمًا أَوْ كَفُورًا And obey not from among them a sinner or an ungrateful one. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to be able to identify the right ulil amr and follow their teachings so that we may be successful. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ اللذی لا الہ الا هو الحلیم الکریم غافر الذنب و قابل التوب و هو الغفور الرحیم سبحان من سبقت رحمته غضب و بسط الیدین بالرحمہ سبحان من لم یکلف نفسا الا دون وسعها و افا ان السیئات و لم یجاز بها سبحان من لا يزداد على معاصي لباد الله كرم وجودا ولا كثرة الذنوب إلا فهم وصفحا نشهد أن لا إله إلا ولا توف ولا الإباد بجودي ولا واد ولا المذنبين بحلمي ونشهد أن محمد النبي هو حبيبا سید المرسلین و شفیع المذربین باثہ رحمتا للعالمین صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ الدعین الى سبیل اللہ بالحکمت والموذت الحسن قادت الامم وولیاء النعم ومعدن الرحمہ مومنین فرسٹ اور فرموست ایسی طرح میں اسے اور ایسی طرح سے آپ کو اپنے ساتھ کو اپنے ساتھ کو اپنے ساتھ کو Today we want to, to speak about a very important subject that is currently happening in our lives. And that is the systematic labeling of Islam and Muslims. There is a very important aspect of portrayal in any name. Whatever name we do, it, there is a portrayal of the person or the group or the community. In today's times, there is a collective effort we see of labeling Muslims in a negative way in society. Instead of Islam and Muslim being an identity, the media is making an extra effort to show it as a negative part of society. The Western media in specific has a concerted effort to keep on giving labels to Muslims and Islam. We are not talking about those who hate the Muslims. Those who hate the Muslims can be have influenced by Islamophobia, or they could have racist ideologies, or they can be xenophobic feelings, religious fundamentalism, Christian, Jewish bigotry, Hindu prejudice, whatever it may be, we are not talking about them. However, besides all this, the politicians and the media are bombarding labels upon the Muslims. Let us look at why they are doing this. There is crime and there is terror. These politicians and media very freely associate labels like Islamic terrorism. The very fact that they put Islamic in front of terrorism creates a fear in people that Islam is a religion of fear, to be feared, is a religion of terror. And whilst an individual who goes on rampage and kills somebody, if he is not a Muslim, it is a crime. Yes, it is a crime. And we will not even in the fine print of that article see what his religion is, whether he was a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew or whatever he may have been. And that is fine. We agree to that because religion has nothing to do with this. A criminal is a criminal and period just that. 
we cannot go that Christians have made him become a criminal. There is no religion that makes crime legal. Now when we look at the crime of a non-Muslim, it is a crime. But when a Muslim commits a crime, Islamic terror, Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic extremism, jihadist movement, etc., etc., are the labels that are given to us. This is not some form of bias against Islam, but rather a systematic labeling of an entire religion which is more than a third of this world's population. And these labels have an impact and create fear amongst people around us. For example, there is a beautiful opinion that was given in the media in Canada last month and says that ISIS is not Islamic and do not call it such because it is not an Islamic state and she beautifully explains that if we are really fighting, talking to the Western governments, that if we are really fighting ISIS, then call it anything else but Islamic, because there is nothing Islamic about what they do. By calling these non-humans Islamic, these countries are actually pray, playing right into the hands of those who are behind these terror acts. And this is exactly what they want. They can be referred to as Daesh. They can be referred to any other names that they come up with. And we have seen they've come with so many names in the recent years. Some months back, even the UK Prime Minister told in Parliament and told them to stop using the word Islamic for these criminals. And he said, that giving them an Islamic to their, naming them as Islamic is what their actions represent. It actually gives a bad name to the religion of Islam. These are the words of the Prime Minister of UK. He says it is not an Islamic state. What it is that it is an appalling, barbarous regime. It is a perversion of the religion of Islam. And most Muslims listening to this recoil. Every time they hear the word Islamic, they do realize that these titles that are being given to the Muslims and Islam are wrong. Six years from today, in 2010, there was a report of international significance that was done in Canada. And he, say, he says that referring to extremists as jihadists, we are effectively recognizing their actions as being path of God and therefore legitimate. Whilst it, Islamic terrorism, jihadism, Islam fascism succeed only in confusing terrorism with mainstream Islam which has got nothing to do with these actions. And this is therefore casting all Muslims as terrorists or potential terrorists. This report is of international significance that was released six years back. Things have gone from bad to worse today. We only hope and pray that the presidential candidates that we have today in our lands are reading these reports and understand and recognize what they are creating in their campaign trails when they start blasting Islam and Muslims as a whole. Recently, there was a crime that was committed. And what was the crime? A young man goes to a recruitment center and starts stabbing innocent people who were there. When he was arrested and questioned, he says, I was told by Allah to do this. We all laugh. We chuckle, we smile. Why? Because there is no Muslim who believes that there was any form of direct conversation from Allah after the departure of Rasulullah Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all understand that when such statements are given, 
we understand that these are statements of lunatics. The first thing that comes to mind is check his intellect. Is he a psychopath? Is he a psychological issue? Then treat him accordingly. If he is deranged or intoxicated, treat him accordingly. However, the media started blaring. When he, was, when he said Allah, they started blaring, saying, Muslim extremist. Mumineen, we also remember a couple of years back, a very senior statesman of this country also said a similar thing when he said, God has told me to do this. And 13 years on today, Iraq is still burning because of that statement. Earlier this week, we saw Brussels being attacked. We all heard the news. It pained us to see that innocent lives were lost. Scores of innocent people who happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time were injured. And there have been a couple of arrests since then. But before anyone was arrested for this, the media had already started jihadism, extremism, Muslimist extremism, Islamic uh, terrorism, etc., and started giving it to the public. But this Brussels attack has a very interesting point that we need to understand. Just four days before the bombing in Brussels happened, just four days, the president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan or Erdogan, whatever he, however his name is pronounced, says something which is either bizarre timing or perhaps foreknowledge. We don't know. His actual statement is that it could see terrorist bombings four days before and attacks in its cities that is addressing Europeans in the near future, if it does not cease to support for the cooperation with the Kurds. And there he added, there is no reason why the bomb that exploded in Ankara cannot explode in Brussels in or any other European city. He has actually mentioned Brussels four days before the Brussels attack. And then he says, the snakes you are sleeping with can bite you any time. Such a statement by a president of a country needs analysis because there are lots of things in these three sentences that he has already said. Another very interesting aspect is that Brussels and many of the European airports the security is, as far as security is concerned, it is governed by and undertaken by former members of Shin Bet, <clears throat> Israel's internal security agency. And they are considered to be some of the best trained security personnel in the world. When we look at this game of labeling, this is not something new that came in the 21st century. This was played long at the time of Rasulullah also, when we see the same game being played. The Quraysh of Makkah, the Kuffar of Makkah, called names to Rasulullah. They, they called him Majnoon, a madman. When it didn't work, they called him Shair, a poet. When it, that also didn't work, they started calling him Sahir, a sorcerer. People were instilled with fear of Rasulullah and Islam 14 centuries ago. And they used to tell him, because if you hear the, his words, you will fall into his spell. The Quran is what he recites, and he will thus bewitch you with it. The extent of fear mongering and Islamophobia of that time was such that people were told not to even go in the alley of the house of Zaid bin Arkham from where Rasulullah used to preach. It didn't end there. Muawiyah made it a state way of instilling fear mongering. We all know during the time of Banu Maya it was Muawiyah 
who started labeling the Ahlul Bayt and Amir al Mu'minin also in particular. It is he who started the practice of cursing Amir al Mu'minin, Imam al Muttaqin, from the members every Friday in the entire Islamic world so that people would get this impression that the Ahlul Bayt is not them, what is in the Quran. This practice ran for over 70 years until, Abdul, uh, until Umar ibn al-Abdul Aziz came and stopped it. Let us think about this. 70 years is more than three generations. People who were born during that time, grew up during that time and even became old during that time. How did they view the Ahlul Bayt and Amir al muminin this was basically to tarnish the name of the Ahlul Bayt and specifically Amir al muminin However, as Muslims who are following the truth, we must understand the Quran, Rasulullah, Islam, Ahlul Bayt, Amir al muminin these are all based on truth only and Allah has promised. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقْ وَزَهَكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُكَ And say, the truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Surely falsehood is a vanishing thing. Where is Muawiyah today? But Ali still stands high in every member today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from such labeling. And at the same time, we need to understand that we as Muslims need to portray ourselves in the truth in every action of ours as well as in every field that we are in because we know of this situation we must be extra careful we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to be able to stand for the truth ameen ya rabbal alamin inna allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima اللهم صل على سيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وعلى إمام المسلمين وقائد الجر المحجلين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب وعلى سيدة نساء العالمين وبذة خاتم النبيين سيدتنا فاطمة بنت رسول الله وعلى السبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة مؤمنين صلوات needs to be recited loud let us recite a loud صلوات in favor of all أهل البيت المسلم اللهم صل محمد وعلى محمد this is the beauty of جمعة that we recite صلوات in a loud manner وإمة الماسومين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجافر بن محمد وموسى بن جافر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي عليه مسلاة والسلام اللهم صل على مولانا صاحب الزمان ما هي آثار البداية والطغيان هذه من الشرك والنفاق حاسدي فروع البغي والشكاك صلوات الله وسلام عليه وعلى باء الكرام متصلت الليالي والأيام اللهم عجل فرجا وصح المخرجا وقل نادرنا بنظرة منا إليه وجعلنا من المستشهدين بين يديه وتفضل على مرائنا المؤمنين بمزيد التوفيقات وازدياد الأقبال وولو الدرجات اللهم افعل بنا ما أنت أهله ولا تفعل بنا ما نحن أهله بجاه محمد وآل الماسومين صلوات الله عليهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر